We're in Myrtle Beach at an Italian restaurant, but our focus is on Japan. Meet somebody who's going to bring them all together. Coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at Villa Romana, Italian restaurant, the Italian restaurant of the year between 7th and 8th Avenue South on Kings Highway in Myrtle Beach. We're focused on teaching abroad and we're visiting with a former English teacher in Japan, Tiffany Jackson. Good morning, Good Tiffany. Good morning, Greg. Thanks, Thanks for so having me. Thanks so much for coming in early on a Tuesday morning. No problem. I'm glad to be here. How long have you been back in the States, Tiffany? Let's see, um, I had my 10-year high school reunion on the 11th of August, and I came back two days before that, so August 8th. Right, so just about two months, a little more than two and a half months now. Yes, yeah, still technically in uh, reverse culture shock mode. <laughs> yes. I bet. You were over there continuously for, is it more than a couple of years? For three years. Um, the contracts run a year concurrently, so right. three years total, and I managed to come home once for Christmas. Is Much to my right? grandma's delight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just one time in three years. You actually get a fair amount of vacation time, but you're situated so well in Southeast Asia that it's difficult not to jaunt off to India or Thailand, right. you know, whenever you get a break. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. How did you actually get over there the first time? And, of course, we'll talk a little bit about yourself uh, in just a minute, but this was a program sponsored, I think you said, by the Japanese government? It is, and there's a little bit of backstory to that. When I was a junior in high school my father worked for a Toyota car dealership right. and they were trying to um, give scholarships to some employees children about 20 across the nation to go to Japan for a summer exchange program right. so I applied and luckily was awarded a scholarship so I spent about two months living there in Nagoya mm -hmm. which is uh, about the third or fourth largest city now in Japan mm -hmm. Nagoya so yeah. while I was there I went to school with my host sister and I basically just wrote letters all day. I mean, I didn't really, you know, know what was going on. Well, let English letters. I mean, you just to uh, my yeah, family and friends back there. home, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right. But at the time, there was a woman there teaching English, um, who didn't speak so much Japanese. And I remember I would walk around and see her in the grocery store, and I thought, how brave that she lives in this huge city and it, it's kind of oblivious to what's going on around right, her. But right. still, what a cultural experience. So I always kept that in the back of my mind. And, right. And then as I was in university, I researched the JET program, which is Japan Exchange and Teaching. Oh, good. And it was actually the program she was on, but you have to have a university degree. Uh -huh. So I put it off for a few years and right. finally got around to applying and um, actually getting over there in July of 2004. That's tremendous. Well, of course, your connection here is you actually grew up in this area. Oh, right. Um, so I was born at Conway Hospital and was grown up in Myrtle Beach and actually graduated from Sockestee High School. Sockestee High School. I think I saw for a little while you were on the mock trial team, you even traveled around, uh, competed. That's right. You know, Sockestee does pretty well at a lot of uh, yeah. extracurricular activities. Go Braves. And uh, <laughs> we did. We made it to nationals quite a few years. We were state champions quite a bit. So went to uh, Pittsburgh, Johnstown, you know, all over competing in right. competitions. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. Well, it was lots of fun for sure, and I think it gave me a good analytical edge, you know, the older I got. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Continued Later, on into university doing that. Matriculated to the USC Honors College, I believe? Mm-hmm, that's correct. Tremendous, yeah. What, what were you studying up there? Um, all kinds of stuff. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know... Big when, smile there, yeah. Uh, you know, it was kind of a little bit early to decide a career path, I think, yeah, when I graduated. 18, 17. So I started out as an English major. Right. Um, then I went on to newspaper, print journalism. Good, yeah. And then I know I, our show sponsor here, right? the Myrtle Beach Herald, great, yeah. And it ended up doing um, electronic journalism, which is kind of radio and television production. Sure, sure. Yeah, but did, did you do any work up there in Columbia or uh, in, in, have any involvement with any radio or TV stations up there? I did, and actually um, the senior practicum program is something called Carolina News, which is a cable news show Good. that's produced every day by students that are seniors in the journalism program. So that was my introduction to television, and we got to produce, direct, anchor, all sorts of things. And after that, I did a little work for the um, primary elections for South Carolina Educational Radio. Great. Subsequently got an internship at ETV, and I have a really strong, warm feeling about their mission um, yes. over at Educational Television, Educational Radio. So I was happy when they took me on part-time while I was in university and then actually worked my way up from 
programmer to director to producer. Eventually. Right now, this uh, phrase in university, similar to in the UK, is it the s s same phraseology in uh, in Japan, for instance, opposed to saying I was in college or I was at USC or Carolina, whatever folks around here from Sakusti would say. I mean, it, in university, is that uh, the phraseology there in Japan? Is that a bit odd? I didn't. Even... Oh well, well yeah, uh, potentially yes. Actually, yeah. they say no. uni. Is that right? So they truncate it down to. Um, and they're pretty good at. No, slang words and taking English and making it their own. Yeah. So it takes um, a lot of concentration for me not to use words like uni. Uh -huh. At uni, you know. Uh huh. Golly, certain aspects of Japan you have trouble, as you say, just getting out of your blood. I mean, there's uh, things that'll be in you, with you forever. It's very true. And one of the things that was most striking when I came back to the States and I went to a restaurant and I ordered food, I couldn't believe the portion size. I'm like, this is enough for three people. Right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Some things like that have, of course, stuck with me. Some yeah. of the words, I say daijoubu a lot, which means like, are you okay? Is it, are you all right? Really? Yeah. And it just slips out before Your I... family here knows what you're saying, or they just look at you, blank stare. My father gave me a lot of grief at first for going, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. I was like some sort of affirmative, like I'm listening to you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Something akin to a uh-huh. That's wild. Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. What was that mission of the ETV there in Columbia that really struck you? You said you were... You were drawn by the mission of ETV. I remember the first time that I ran across an ETV program when I was a starving college student and didn't have cable and some bunny ears and, and was just fascinated by the documentary style and the educational nature of the programming. And so I started tuning in more and more. And I think they've got a catchphrase that really sums it up. Stay curious. Mm. I think I'm pretty inquisitive on, on the whole. And I love it when I tune in there. And it's everything from historical facts to local and current events and I'm a current events junkie. Are you really? Oh, yeah. 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 So I appreciate uh, what they do there. That's great, Tiffany. Well, you know, as you think about obviously studying journalism and getting active, even in broadcast or radio, uh, bro broadcast television or radio there in Columbia, have you contemplated that? Uh, as you said, it, it, entering university, 18, 19, tough making a decision there, what you want to do for the rest of your life now, a few years later, you may have some idea. Are you thinking about journalism possibly as a career? Or are you still trying to make that decision? Yeah. A few years later, I would say I'm borderline more confused than ever. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Which, you know, after going and experiencing something like living abroad for three right, years in a right. place that's so radically different from what you're used yeah, to. Yeah, I want to talk about that. It really opens up the world and a lot of opportunities in a way that you know, things that may have been scary before or may have seemed insurmountable. Well, now I've got this, perhaps it's a confidence that... I didn't necessarily have before that makes me think I could just pack up and move to Brazil really? and make yeah. it happen and it right. might, you know, might not be too... Yeah, that's right. exciting. That's but, ex but I do, I regularly look online for jobs at public radio stations, Seattle, uh -huh. Austin, Texas. <laughs> Good right. for you, yes. It's Good places to be. Both still of swirling them. around in there. Right. What about, are there lots of Americans in, in Japan? Is it being overtaken by Americans? <laughs> Quite the contrary. That was one of the more startling aspects when I first arrived. I can remember stepping off of the Shinkansen, which is the bullet train. Mm. And is it really a bullet train? I mean, it's, uh, it's quick. Yes, it Faster is. Faster our metros. I wish I could give you some numbers, but I, yeah, I can't. It's quick. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I was in Tokyo Station, which is one of the largest in the country, and I, I just sat there mouth agape, like, turning in a circle, and I realized I was the only non-Asian that oh, I could see. At, at that moment, I'm right. sitting there with my bag, and I, yeah. I was really overwhelmed because I've never... I've never been a minority in that significant of a way. Luckily, growing up in my generation, being a woman is not the handicap that it Maybe once was, perhaps, early right? Early part of the last century, yeah. Um, so, you know, and in the big cities, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, there are more foreigners. Uh -huh. um, but overall in the country, according to the Bureau of Statistics in Japan, Ooh. it's 0.91% of people residing there are non-Japanese. So oh, less come than, on. Less than 1% are non-Japanese? Yeah, and of that fraction of a percent, actually three-quarters are of Asian descent, which is uh, Korean and Chinese mostly. Right. Who right. reside there. So actually seeing Caucasians is a rarity. The farther you get from the big city, you know, the more rare that becomes. And I lived quite a ways out of the big city. So. How many folks are in Japan? How large is that... Uh 
How large is the country? Not to put you on the spot. Are you putting me on the spot here? Go to the Bureau of Statistics. I mean, come Let's on. Let's see. Yeah. Um, there are 14 million in Tokyo. I don't have a clue. It's a big old about the uh, country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, a lot of folks. You said 14 million in Tokyo. Well, that's cited so frequently because right. of the actual population density there. I mean, it's such a small place, and mm -hmm. you just put them in high rises and pack them in there, and mm -hmm. so that's probably why I've, I've heard that one over and over again. Now, were you actually teaching in Tokyo? You were in one of the other. Uh, you, I think, you wrote it out here, Nigata. Pref Niigata Prefecture. Prefecture. Prefecture mm -hmm. means what? It's akin to a state. Okay, yeah, great. Just Good. A political department. And actually, Niigata is on the west coast, almost directly across from Tokyo. So it's kind mm. of a straight shot, about two hours and 15 minutes on the bullet train. And the bullet train connects those two? Well, there are a few transfers it's here a and there. Stop -offs, yeah. Right. Yeah, I can get um, as far as Nagano which is actually a fairly well-known city. I think the 96 Winter Olympics were held there. Uh -huh. And that's uh -huh. about 45 minutes from where I lived. So I'd have to take a local train from there home. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you think about your first, when you first arrived there three plus years ago, Tiffany, versus when you were leaving, were there any changes that really, really stood out in the country itself? Just, I mean, not even thinking about what it was like for you as an American arriving there, uh, cl clearly being part of a very t tiny minority, but uh, what about changes in that country? Anything uh, in just uh, systemically that you recognize? Mm. I mean, there was definitely a political shift from mm, Koizumi to Shinzo Abe, which is something that I was fairly well acquainted with, you know, keeping up as best I could. And uh, not many of our viewers know what you're talking about. I'm sorry, excuse these me. Are, I, these are, are prime, prime ministers. ministers sorry. Okay. Yeah, so the yeah. political climate shifted quite a bit while I was there, which is something that I didn't have uh, any direct contact with, but, you know, enjoyed overhearing other right. folks discuss, although politics is not a big um, coffee discussion for Japanese people in general. Really? I wonder why. Um, they're very conservative and tend to be, um, I don't know, unified in a lot of opinions. Uh -huh. They have a phrase called kukio yomu which means to read the air. To read the air. So they don't really have to discuss. Everyone just kind of acts in accord because uh, they've read it on the air. Right. Um, so there's, there's not much dissenting opinion that's tossed around lightly uh -huh. in the country. And some of the stark differences between the Eastern world there and our Western world, as many folks call it, uh, what are some of the big differences? I wanted to ask about just that form of government for viewers who may not be familiar exactly with the form of government, but what are some of the big differences? This, that phrase you just used, what was that again? Kuki o yomu, to air, to read the air. To read the air, mm -hmm. that's fascinating. How about some of the big differences between uh, Japan and uh, of course we want to talk a little bit about teaching and what that was like since our focus on teaching abroad. But, but it's so interesting too to go there and it's just I mean, absolutely different than anything I've grown up with or experienced before. So right. there's great focus on family there. Really? Um, the family unit is incredibly strong, and they're incredibly loyal to their family. You know, mm -hmm. kids don't just up and move away to Japan for three years and uh, <laughs> leave their parents back home. Right, you know? yeah. Right. It was interesting you asked about a shift. While I was there, I had an older female friend who was probably the best non-native English speaker I met during uh -huh. my time there and she had a son who married traditionally the first son marries and the wife moves into the family home so she then begins to care for the in-laws uh -huh. as well as holding down a full-time job caring for the children cooking all the meals it's quite a role to play and well, caring for a poor husband yes oh, yeah. right, right. let alone everything else yeah and so I, I saw a shift in this that my friend's son had a talk with her and said you know we don't want to live together we want to get our own place and it was it was quite heartbreaking for her, and, and she's fairly progressive in her thinking. Like I said, she's a right. good English speaker, and so that was an interesting tipping point, I think. Um, but there's no mandate to do. I mean, that's just uh, society speaking or society changing a little bit. There's no mandates. I mean, it's not a totalitarian government, obviously. Clearly, they're very open. But government, the form of government is what? Is it uh, just, is it a democracy? Is, mm -hmm. that, is it really? Yeah. Yes, and um, you know they, they do vote and have elections and that right. sort of thing. Um, they have a parliament that's, I don't know, very partisan, uh -huh. um, which we may notice a little something right. about. Well, right, right now, it's, we've had funny shifts, of course, in our own government, but yes, mm -hmm. very partisan. Mm -hmm. And also thinking about like the loyalty to family, and right. another thing that struck me as a huge difference was the integrity or trustworthiness of people. I mean, I could go 
into a dance club in downtown Tokyo, right. leave my purse on the table, and go to the dance floor and dance, and come back and it's undisturbed. Uh. I mean, people are just incredibly honest there, and you know, coming back, I've seen a difference in that too. Someone earlier, one of your uh, directors, I believe, mentioned to me his motorcycle had been stolen. Yes, yes. Clutch the pearl. You know, I, I know, I, yeah. It's such a, a stark difference for me to come back and you know, it's not yours. Why would you touch it? And so over there, they're very upstanding. And um, that's probably one of the places you could still make contracts on a handshake or a bow. Right. As it is, you know, and, and they would stand up for it. So many large companies based in Japan that have such an impact, like the one your father worked for formerly, I mean, like Toyota. Mm -hmm. And to think about the impact and, and the amount of sales in this country that have impacted, obviously, them dramatically helped many of the companies in Japan flourish. To think that some of America has not had a big impact on that country. It's, uh, do you see uh, influences? big influences, McDonald's, bigger than life, arches or anything over there that really stands out? I mean, do you, do you pass some things and feel, oh, I'm home, or any sense of that? I never had a, oh, wow, I feel like I'm yeah. in the States In Sox moment. Or Myrtle, but yeah, right. Right, right, no, right. I never had one of those, but, you know, there's definitely a prevalence of fast food, which, you know, the dichotomy between the older generation and the younger generation. The younger generation kind of welcomes that Western influence. They want to wow. wear Levi's that yeah. are outrageously priced. You wow. know, they want to eat at McDonald's. And the older generation is kind of dragging their heels, kicking and screaming. Really? And, um, so, you know, 7-Eleven is probably the biggest example of a presence in Japan. Right. Huh. So they're on nearly every street corner. Oh, come on. I, like here, Eagles, Wings. Yes. Right? Yeah. Without There's exaggeration. There's 7-Eleven on every street corner. But let me tell you how much better they are than American 7-Elevens. You can go in there and eat lunch, uh -huh. and it's incredible. Fresh sushi, great rice and noodle dishes, and, I mean, all sorts of, of good daily-made foods. And so they're quite respectable, actually. And if you're not joshing, the reason they could have one on every street corner is because there's so many folks between each street corner? I mean, there's just, uh, you're going up and they're packed in, is that right? Theoretically. Uh -huh. And people rely on those sorts of convenience stores a lot more than we do. They're not right. gas stations, they're, you know, shopping spots that you hit on the way home. Is there a lot of driving over there? I mean, are gas stations prevalent? I mean, is there a, we're thinking about the bullet train, and I know I want to get on that, excuse me, I'm just so fascinated, we probably should have just made this interculturalism that, rather than we'll teaching abroad. We'll get around the, the yeah. program. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of driving, and you know, of course, the farther you go out in the countryside, right. the uh, more sparse train stations are. And right. So in my town, I had a car. I mm. actually um, worked once at a high school in the mountains. It was about 45 minutes from my home. So it was best if I just drove there as opposed to bicycle, bus, train, mm -hmm. another bus, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, interestingly, self-serve gas stations are very, very rare. Mm. So I didn't pump gas for about three years, which is interesting yet they have very low unemployment in japan mm. it's because they do a good job at carving out niches for you know senior citizens or people who would otherwise be retired or mm -hmm. um so yeah there's some driving but in the cities not recommended you know ronaldo who opened the show for us to get us started this morning mentioned that he's one of seven children big families small families are they all uh, no more than two children three children or, or did you see families that had seven and eight kids mm -hmm. uh, not seven and eight children per se, but such an exciting time, I think, when I was in Japan, because I mentioned before, a tipping point, and now more than ever, women are waiting till later and later to have children, so they're not having as large of families. Um, right. You know, generations ago, you would see two or three brothers, three or four sisters right. in a household, uh, but now I would say um, two children on average, not extremely large families, but they stay very close-knit, so the aunts and uncles and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, you know. Right. Lots of them often live in the same home together, so it's practically a big family. The prefecture or the state you were in there, Tiffany, or th when we think about homes, of course, even small, or living in an apartment complex that you talked about there in Columbia, are apartment complexes common or are homes spread out as you go further from the big cities? Or when we think about all these developments here in the Myrtle Beach area. You know, it's, I hate to generalize about it, but in my experience, I lived in an apartment even in Joe at City in Niigata Prefecture, which is a, like Myrtle Beach, right. South Carolina, uh -huh. fairly a small town, you know, relatively. Right. So there are apartment complexes, no high rises. But actually, family homes are probably more popular in the sense they get passed down generation to generation. So I would, I would visit people and 
It was the home that their great grandparents built, or you know. Right. So it's kind of nice to see the history and stuff that I don't know gathered in those sorts of places, and yeah. they have shrines in their homes, Buddhist shrines that have been there for decades and decades. Uh -huh. When we think about, of course, for many Americans, they think about either very positive or, or negative memories of just Japan in general, even older folks possibly. Are there any sense now of there's a, a welcoming? I mean, obviously, many of the young, younger folks want you to be in the classroom. They're thrilled to learn uh, English. Did you have a sense that there was ever any disdain for, uh, for Americanism or for Americans, the Western culture? I did. Um... And I must say that I had some moments where I was like, I'm obviously not wanted here. I should just go home. <laughs> I know, yeah. But, it, you know, as with traveling and living anywhere, it was in turns exciting and frustrating, and I wanted to pull my hair out, and then it would be the most eye-opening experience I'd ever had. And, right. Um, you know, there were times when older people who have a little um, harder ways of thinking, I think, not so malleable, not so open to interculturalism. You know, they wouldn't sit, sit next to you on the train or... Oh. If you see a gaijin, which is the word for a foreigner, it's kind of a derogatory term. Uh -huh. It actually means outside person. Mm. You know, I look like an outside person, so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I've been there three years, and I'm fairly comfortable using the language. And mm -hmm. Just to take a glance, and they're nervous. They don't have much self-confidence. Um, they don't engage very well with foreign people, mm -hmm. a lot of the older folks. So there were times when I... Uh, I did feel not so welcome, mm -hmm. and I had the great opportunity to go to Hiroshima, which mm. is, um, they have an atom bomb museum there, and right. it was very moving, but I, w I was surprised that that was probably one of the places that I felt most welcome. Mm. They were incredibly gracious that Americans want to go there and, right. and see what happened and see their side of it. That's fascinating. We've got about five minutes, Tiffany, I hate to say, and you know, there's so many fascinating things, some of the points of interest, experiences for you that really stick out. I think one of them I saw on here that obviously stuck out there close at hand where you were involved with some other teachers and putting together, was it a charitable play? Was it a It production? was a musical, right. although I'm not musical, as long as we don't count karaoke, because that's just like a <laughs> rite of passage in Japan. Um, so we put together a musical that performed around the prefecture. I mean, it took months and months to... You traveled around? Mm -hmm. Wow. And I actually played in venues, I mean, most of them larger than high school gymnasiums. Some of them were orchestral venues, and right. so these were pretty big spaces. Um, we produced, directed, created all the props, marketed, you know, performed in it, and then took all of the money that we raised and purchased school supplies, um, had some supplies donated, but also wood, nails, paint, and that sort of thing. And. Uh -huh. There are 30, about 35 of us, including some Japanese kids who could also speak English. They were good go-betweens, and we were doing the marketing and stuff. Right, um, right. Liaisons. A few of us, about 15, eventually traveled to Papua New Guinea, which is a little south of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with where it's at. Um, and it's an incredibly rural, um, third world country at this mm -hmm. point. And we went to a village there in the... Waria River Valley, it was actually a school called AU Primary, so we built desks and re-roofed buildings and uh -huh. painted and donated school supplies and just played and lived and yeah. hung out with these families that, it was incredibly humbling and, right. and moving to see how little they had and how darn happy they are, mm -hmm. you know, how well they get along with each other. And That's great. It was incredible. You know, as you sit back now and think about Seattle or Austin or Brazil or being anywhere, are, are there thoughts that maybe you want to go back, you want to be there, or is there something pulling at uh, any heartstrings saying, other than just sharing that story right there, anything that's saying, I need to get back there, or is there anything you miss particularly? Yeah, I miss great sushi. Great cheap sushi. <laughs> right, great cheap sushi, yeah. Um, you know, I, I do have a special place in my heart for Japan, having spent time there on multiple right. occasions. Yeah. and. But also, I've got a mm, itch of the wanderlust, you know. I, there's so many places in the world I haven't been and yeah. haven't experienced. So um, I don't have any immediate plans to go back there. Right. Are you going to grab your dad and take him on some of these trips? Can you pull him out? Yeah. Well, he's actually German by descent, and oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm working on him. I'm convinced we need to go to Oktoberfest next oui, year. Oui, oui, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. You know, as you think, of any experiences that stick out, of course, that's a special one. Just if you, uh, as you think about, uh, think back there, obviously, if you're not going to be living back there, anything that you want to take from your three-plus years there 
to the U.S. and try to share, to spread here, whether in Seattle or Austin or anywhere, even in Sakasti, Myrtle Beach. You know, there are some superficial things, like I don't let anyone wear shoes in my house anymore. Ooh. You know, you take them off at the door. You, um, I'm interested in their, their interest in physicality. I mean, even up into their 80s, they're, they're very physical, mountain climbing and that sort of thing. Really? And, and actually, one of the things that, that I've really tried to impress upon people coming back is their environmentalism. They are incredible recyclers. I had eight garbage cans when I was there. Mm. And like the first and third Tuesday, you could throw this away. The second, you know, it's because they don't have a lot of space for landfills. And they recycle. They take care of their natural habitat. I mean, so that's something that I, that I think we should do a better job of, something akin to what they do. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Tiffany, thanks so much for being with us this morning. I'm sorry we've run out of time. It was my pleasure. Thank yeah, you, Greg. Yeah, probably can't get any uh, great uh, cheap sushi here at Villa Romana, but you can get an amazing Italian meal. Get back here. Stay tuned to more Carolina people with Tiffany Jackson coming up next. If you've been sitting here the last 30 minutes, you've probably been saying, Greg, go ahead and ask her about Buddha. Ask her about earthquakes. Ask her about tsunamis. Well, why didn't you ask her that, Greg? We had this great time here, 25 minutes with this young lady, and you didn't ask her about Buddhist temples or traveling around or doing other things or tsunamis that are impacting the country, earthquakes. What's happening? Take the time to write this down, japanbystorm.blogspot.com, japanbystorm.blogspot.com. Now, I know a lot of folks are saying, I don't go online, I don't do anything. I'm not going to take the time. You can go to the library, just go in, japanbystorm.blogspot.com. Learn about what it was like three years over there. The experiences, of course, we didn't even have a chance to talk about her amazing gastronomical uh, uh, evening there in Tokyo before coming back to the States. A lot that happened over a three-year period, making a difference for folks uh, opening up America as well as uh, opening up Japan to Tiffany. It was an experience you'll never forget. Check her out online, japanbystorm.blogspot.com.